I remember when I was uh, 15, I think it was, I first came across some words of John Wesley's father. John Wesley's father wrote to him at one point, the inward witness, son, the inward witness, that is the proof, the strongest proof of Christianity. You'll find those words on page 100 of Wesley's works, volume 12. And before you think that I was a childhood genius and had reached volume 12 of Wesley's works, I actually first came across the words in a movie about John Wesley. And I think because I was fresh as a young Christian and the work of the Spirit was so remarkable to me, they stuck in my mind. The inward witness, son, that is the real proof of Christianity. I wasn't altogether sure what Wesley's father had meant. But of course, he was speaking about these extraordinary words that Paul writes in Romans chapter 8 and verse 15, when he says that the Spirit comes to us as the Spirit not of slavery, but of sonship. He is the Spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself in this way bears witness with our spirits that we really are the children of God. We've been thinking about some aspects of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. By no means have we fully ransacked all biblical teaching on the Holy Spirit. But I wanted to end our studies together by thinking about the Spirit in terms of Paul's language here as the Spirit of Sonship. There's a very interesting passage in the third book of Calvin's Institutes where he's speaking about the ministry of the Spirit in the life of the believer. And he says this, he says, the chief title of the Holy Spirit, his words are, the first title of the Holy Spirit is Spirit of Sonship. Now, Calvin knew his Bible well enough to know that chronologically, that's not the first title of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit isn't called Spirit of Sonship, except in Romans chapter 8 and in Galatians chapter 4. He didn't mean it was the first title that was given to the Spirit. What he actually meant was, it's the supreme title that's given to the Spirit. It is the first ranked title that is given to the Spirit. And he said that, I think, rightly, because as we read through the teaching of the New Testament about the ministry of the Spirit, at the end of the day, that's what the Spirit of God is given to us for that we might be born again into the family of God, that we might live as the sons of God, and especially that we might have a sense that we really are the children of God. You know that you can almost summarize uh, Romans chapter 8 in two statements. It begins with the gospel that teaches us there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and it ends with the statement, nor is there any separation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the reason for this is that God takes us from the condemned cell of sinners and brings us into His family. And He pledges Himself as a heavenly Father, so to work everything together for good for those who love Him, that His blood-bought children will ultimately be conformed to the likeness of His own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the whole of the Christian life, and the purpose of the Spirit's ministry is to bring us into the family of God, to give us a consciousness that we belong to the family of God, and to enable us to live as children of the family of God. What father would not want this for his children? And this is what the heavenly father wants for his children, that we should be able to look at him and say to him, Father. Remember how right at the beginning of our studies we thought about the way in which in the Old Testament Scripture sometimes the presence of the Spirit of God and the unveiling of the face of God are closely connected together. And this is the 
This is the apex of that biblical teaching, that as the Spirit of God who has come to us through Jesus Christ unveils the face of the first person of the Trinity, it unveils His face to us as our Heavenly Father. That's one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why the New Testament, almost from start to finish, is so full of Christians speaking to God as their Heavenly Father. We do this every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven. We do this every time we call one another brothers and sisters. We are the children of the Heavenly Father. It is, in a sense, the, the all-embracing description of what it means to be Christians, that we are His children, that He cares for us as our Heavenly Father, and that He gives us His Holy Spirit to give us a consciousness that this is the case. I have a friend uh, who, as a missionary, he and his wife adopted a little girl from the country in which they were missionaries. And I'll never forget him telling me the story of how this little girl transitioned from being the member of one family until she felt fully that she was the member of his family. He said one of the things that he struggled with for ages was that this little girl who was legally his simply couldn't bring herself to say father to him. He did everything he could. He loved her as his own. He taught her. He embraced her in every way, but he had never once heard the word father from her lips until one day she appeared at his desk with a little shoe in her hand, and she said, Father, I've broken my shoelace. And he said he would, have, he would have gone out and he would have bought a shoe shop. So thrilled was he that although she was naturally the child of another family, now she had developed this consciousness that she really did belong to his family. And you know, when we are brought from darkness into light, when we are justified sinners, it doesn't automatically follow that subjectively in our consciousness we enjoy all the privileges of the gospel. And so the Holy Spirit works in our lives. Sometimes it can be immediate, sometimes it can be dramatic. Oftentimes, I think, in the Christian life, it is a slow, Spirit-given process until it dawns on us that we really are the children of God, that we really are His sons. And it's this that Paul is focusing our attention on here when he says, we've not received the spirit of bondage to fall back again into fear, but we have received the spirit of sonship by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You may be wondering why Paul uses the language of sonship. Does he not believe that God has got daughters? Oh, there's an explanation for that. Uh, those of you who know Jane Austen's great novel, Pride and Prejudice, probably can guess what the explanation is. What's the problem in the household in Pride and Prejudice? It's uh, that uh, Mr. Bennett's only got daughters. Well, what's the problem with having only daughters? In that era throughout the Western world, daughters never inherited. And so, the family is likely to lose everything. The estate is entailed on the nearest male relative, who happens to be rather a slimy character, doesn't he? And uh, that's the world of uh, the Bible. Daughters don't inherit, only sons inherit. That's why Paul uses this language that whether you are male or female, whether you are by nature a son or a daughter, all in Christ become the sons of God, because in Christ we've come to share in a glorious inheritance. And he emphasizes that, doesn't he, in verses 18 and 19. He says, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed 
to us. Now, what is that glory? It's the fact, verse 17, of children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may be glorified with Him. So, God makes us His heirs so that all the blessings that are stored up for us in Jesus Christ may be brought to us and applied to us by the Spirit of God as He works in our hearts as the spirit of adoptive sonship. But there's something very marvelous to notice in this passage, and Paul puts it like this. He says, we have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now, you see what he's saying. He's saying, one of the one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is so to work within us a consciousness of the Heavenly Father's love for us that we are bold to call God our Father. It's not just part of the liturgy, but it's a reality in our lives. Actually, again, the verb that Paul uses here is a very significant one. Even if you don't know any Greek, I think you would be able to catch a sense of the meaning of this verb. The verb he uses is kradzin, and it's an onomatopoeic word. It's expressive of a sharp cry. Actually, it's used in the Gospels of Jesus crying out with a loud voice on the cross. It's used in the Psalms in the in the Greek version of the Psalms, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard his cry. It's not the calm, whimpering sound that a baby makes. I've heard these words interpreted that way, you know. The work of the Holy Spirit is to bring us to such a sense of rest that, that we're like a sleeping infant in, uh, in its mother or father's arms. That's not what Paul means at all. Paul's speaking about crisis here. He's speaking about suffering. He's speaking about pain. He's speaking about circumstances that make me cry out, that make me shout out. You think of uh, memories. Do you have memories running along the, the sidewalk in the, in the summer and tripping and banging your head and the blood pouring out your nose? And in that ghastly situation, what was the first thing you did? If you were a boy, you shouted, Daddy, Daddy, help me. Your father hopefully came along in order to help you. That's the picture Paul is using. And the great thing is this. I find this the great thing. This sense that I'm a child of God, that I'm a son of God, is not something that God reserves for the top 10 percentiles of the Christian population. You know, if you reach a certain level of sanctification, when things get rough, then I'll come alongside you and help you. He's saying, no, the weakest Christian in his most distressed situation has this assurance in their hearts that I am their Heavenly Father. And the proof positive of that is that when they are in that situation, they don't cry out, Oh God, if there is a God. They cry out, Oh Heavenly Father, come to me, help me. I wonder if you've noticed that. Perhaps your friends who aren't Christians, they've gone through difficult days, some tragedy comes across them. They may even be churchgoers, may even be church members. But if they're not true believers, their typical language is, I don't know why God is allowing this in my life. Or, oh God, they may cry out. Oh God, they may cry out. They may be able to say, if they go to a church where they say the Lord's Prayer, as our Lord Jesus taught us together to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven. But it's not an instinct in them. It's just a liturgy. But you see, the difference with the true believer is the true believer has this deep-seated instinct that sometimes is even hidden from ourselves, that in time of crisis, our instinct is to say, Oh, Father. 
And it's in that very cry, notice what Paul says, it's in that very cry that the Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we really are the children of God. That's astonishing, isn't it? But that's how a father would be. If you're a real father with your children, you want them to know that in their deepest crisis, I remember my parents saying to me, no matter what happens, Sinclair, always used to want to say to them, what do you mean, what happens? You know, like my mother used to say to me, if anything happens to me, Sinclair, and I wanted to say, what do you mean if anything happens to you? Things are happening to you all the time. Whatever happens to you, know that we will be there for you. Know that we love you. Know that we are devoted to you. Now, if sinful human parents can be like that, remember how Jesus put it? If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? And so He gives us, amazing though it is, He gives us the spirit of sonship that when we are in times of difficulty and crisis, we may cry out to Him. And as the words come from our mouths, it dawns on us, I really am a child of God. He really is my Heavenly Father. Whatever happens to me or with me, I know that I am safe with Him. That's not something the non-Christian can experience because he's not a child of God. And so we can't instinctively cry out, O oh, Heavenly Father. But when we are born again of the Spirit of God, as the Spirit of God ministers to us and works in our lives, this becomes our deepest instinct. And you know this, don't you? This is an amazing thing. Actually, you can be become so accustomed to it that you forget what a great privilege it is, and then something happens. I say, oh, Father, I'd forgotten I had this privilege. I thank you so much that the Spirit you've given to me is the Spirit of Sonship who bears witness with my spirit that I really am a child of God. Now, that brings us to the last thing I want us to think about. If God has given to us the Spirit of His Son, adopted us into His family, and wants to bring us a consciousness that we really, really belong to Him, then there's another dimension to this altogether that Paul is working at all the way through this passage in Romans chapter 8. What is God's ultimate goal for those who are His children? Well, I suppose it might be common to say, well, his ultimate goal is to work everything together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's why he predestined us, called us, justified us, and glorifies us. My question is this, what good does God have in view? What is that good? You know, there's a tendency for us to uh, say, I find this sometimes, how do you know God really loves me? because all kinds of good things are happening in my life. Well, what's going to happen when all kinds of bad things happen in your life, you see? We mustn't ourselves define the good towards which God is working. And one reason for that is because in this passage, God Himself defines the good towards which He is working. For those God foreknew, He predestined, to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. You see, God's ultimate goal, the purpose of the Spirit's ministry, is to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Lord Jesus might be able to stand before the Heavenly Father, as we're told in Hebrews 2, He does, and say, Father, here am I, and the children you've given me, the family you've given me, the brothers and sisters you've given me. And the reason the Holy Spirit works in our hearts is to bring us from where we are by nature. We are renegades. We 
are haters rather than lovers of the Lord. We are children of the devil, says the apostle of John, the apostle of love, the apostle John. But by God's grace, we've been brought into His family. And in that family, the Holy Spirit more and more is transforming us into the likeness of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Because, he says, he wants Jesus to be the firstborn among many brothers. So that in your Christian life, the Holy Spirit makes you more like Jesus, and your Christian brothers and sisters are able to say, my, he, she, is getting more and more like the Lord Jesus. I was a young boy at school. I, I had an older brother who was uh, almost three years older than I, and I followed him both through elementary school and through high school. And uh, uh, in some ways, he was everything I was not. And occasionally, I found myself in elementary school following a couple of years behind and having exactly the same teacher that he had, much to my disadvantage. Most of all, I remember Mrs. Woods. Mrs. Woods admired, I think, my brother, and I had the obverse effect on her. And Mrs. Woods had this rather perverse habit every single day. Uh, we would be lined up at the front of the class, and uh, we would hold our hands out like that. She would inspect the front of our hands to see if we had washed them. And then when she got to the end of the row, we'd turn our hands around, and she would see if our nails were clean. And then she would look at the shoes. The boys had been out playing soccer in the playground, shoes bashed to pieces. And then, and this was a generational thing, she would go round the back, first time round was to see that there weren't any nasty things running around in our hair, and then the last pass was to check our heels to see that we'd been true gentlemen and polished the back of our shoes as well as the front of our shoes. And then she would dismiss the cleanest and smartest boy first and then all the way down the rank. And I, I, this must have happened day and daily, but there was only one occasion I still remember, and that was the occasion when I was standing on my own at the end of the line, and all the other boys were back in their seats, and she shrieked at me. And she had a, she had a very sharp voice. She shrieked at me, Ferguson, she said, you're nothing like your elder brother. And I was dismissed. I bear the psychological wounds to this day, you might think. But you know, after I became a Christian and began to meditate on these passages, I began to think, I hope Mrs. Woods is in heaven, so that the first time I meet her, I'll be able to say to her, you remember the last thing either of us remember about our relationship, Mrs. Woods, when you said to me, you're nothing like your elder brother. Look at me now. And I'm not speaking about my natural elder brother. I'm speaking about my Savior, Jesus Christ. Because we are nothing like our elder brother. But the love that the Holy Spirit has for the Lord Jesus is such that He is determined to make us within our own personalities by God's grace more and more like our elder brother, Jesus Christ, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. How much the Holy Spirit loves the Father to regenerate us into His family, and how much the Holy Spirit must love the Lord Jesus to make sinners like ourselves like Him. So we praise not only the Father nor the Son, but together with the Father and the Son, with the whole church of Jesus Christ, we praise the name of the Holy Spirit and thank God for His gift. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank You for this gift of the Holy Spirit, and not only for the gift of the Holy Spirit, but for the way You have made His ministry known. And we want to yield to Him and never to grieve Him. We pray that more and more He may make us like our Lord Jesus Christ, and this we pray together to you, our Father, in the power of the Spirit and in the name of our Savior Jesus. 
Amen.